Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you. My name is Rebecca Wiles, and I am the Automotive Director for the Atlantic Region of Sales uh, with Effective. So today we're going to discuss how leveraging your dealership's data in combination with effective subscriber data can really enhance your TV and digital strategies. We're going to discuss reaching audiences at scale and provide actionable, unique insights in order to maximize every dollar spent on your marketing campaign. We have an incredible lineup of speakers today and I'll get to the introductions in just a second. Before I do that, we have a chat feature. So if there's any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to follow up with any of the answers to these questions. So again, as mentioned, the speakers we have today, we have Kevin Tynum with Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, it's gonna talk about the forecast for auto of 2021. We also have Kevin Bacon, who is the digital director for automotive with effective and gonna talk about really um, unique and enhanced targeting abilities, measurements, and attribution. We have Darcy Heaser, who is a regional auto specialist, also supporting Atlantic region with Effective. And then last but not least, we have John Berna, who is the CEO of Driven Data and a very valued agency partner with us that's going to talk about a campaign he's launched and realized amazing success. So first, let's start with Kevin Tynan. Again, Kevin is with Bloomberg. He is the Global Research Automotive Director, uh, has been since 2009 is gonna to talk to us really about just the audience segments, total volume sales, uh, new versus used in retail and some online trends. Um, and with that, very excited to have you, Kevin, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and thanks for having me again. Uh, we've done this, I guess, a couple of times now. So uh, we'll look ahead at what's going on in 2021. And really there's, there's two valuation points, two different parts of the auto industry that I want to talk about today, both uh, related to, to retail and to dealerships, um, and really a situation where valuation is really driving strategy uh, in the auto space, probably for a time longer than we've ever seen before. Uh, and I usually start with this first slide. I, I think I did on the last one as well. So for everything we hear about electrification and changes in the industry, uh, what we have here is our, our uh, U.S. vehicle mix slide, just simply car versus truck. The white line is, is our truck mix, and trucks in this instance are going to uh, represent crossovers, SUVs, pickup trucks, minivans, and cars or any other remaining coupes, sedan, sports car. And you can see what's happened with the mix here. We're at record levels. We, we, we pushed up those, those red vertical bars are recessions and you can see through the between the 2001 and 2008 2009 recession we started to push up heavier in trucks again uh, high gasoline prices knocked that back and really since 2013 it's been a straight up run to where we are now and that's 78 percent and what i've been saying is you know, this is 80, then it's 85, and it probably ends up being 90% of the mix in, in time, you know, maybe by mid-decade. So while we're hearing more and more about electrification and the companies that are producing those vehicles, we're actually selling as automakers and dealerships and buying as consumers more trucks than ever. So what this means, and, and just to give you a little bit more detail on this, right? So if we look at this here, we look at things at, in Bloomberg uh, by two different measures mainly, well, a lot of measures, but two main ones, right? So the first one is going to be volume, just simply units, one car, one truck, count as one. And you can see, and obviously 2020 was a, was a year impacted by, by the virus um, and where that top line of 14.6 million units would normally be in the high 16s or low 17 million. So probably lost about two and a half million units of, of total volume in the industry. So that mix there that you see, the 11.2 uh, in, in truck is 77%, which we saw on the previous slide. But what's interesting is over here, where we talk about retail revenue, which is that middle column, which also was down again, uh, not as bad because the mix shifted, uh, but overall revenue was down a little bit. But you can see the mix there where by units, it's it's 77%. By revenue, it's 81% and climbing. And again, this number will be over 90% and in, in not too far in the future. And the reason for that, that you're going to see continue is that average transaction price, that ATP column. And what you have there is 
trucks averaging $41,000 in retail revenue per sale and cars averaging 32. And then even if you were to a straight line, a margin number to those, your, your profit contribution is going to be better because you're selling vehicles that, that cost more. So because of this, you can see that the average price in the U.S. is up to $39,000. It'd probably be over 40. And there's months that it is over 40, like December. Um, and this is what the manufacturers see. This is what retailers see is push the products with the higher revenue and profit contribution. So when I say this doesn't reverse, right, this is not something dependent on gasoline prices. This is not ever getting back to 50-50. If anything, it's going 90-10 and it'll stay there um, because it's the influence of the manufacturer more than the pull of the consumer saying we want trucks. Um, and that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Now, where electrification gets interesting is when we look at the market capitalization of the largest automakers, we see this real disconnect. And, and, and I don't know if I call it a bubble, but it looks a lot like any bubble I've ever seen in, in my 20 plus years of doing this. Um, so market capitalization of Tesla is over $600 uh, billion dollars and you know, it's obviously a very volatile number. It'll go up, it'll come down. It went up a lot in 2020 and it's been coming down in 2021 in the early stages. But, you know, if you look at those other companies, the interesting one to me is, is a, a Chinese manufacturer called Neo, which is which had spent time above a hundred uh, hundred billion dollars of, of market cap, um, you know, and sold about 43,000 units last year which is a market cap comparable to what General Motors does, Stellantis, which is the former Fiat Chrysler, and Ford, uh, which are selling millions of vehicles globally per year. So there's a little bit of disconnect between the valuation and at least the volume at this point. So the other way we'll, we look at this is adjusted pre-tax profit. So where uh, the market cap is for Tesla and Neo relative to their volume is very high. It's also very high relative to their profitability. So uh, you can see, and I and I and I pulled together this chart, and it's really back to 2013. This is cumulative adjusted pre-tax profit. General Motors is earning 80 billion dollars in a year, um, but it's back to 2013, which is when Tesla really started its mass market, mass volume, mass market pursuits with Model S. So in that time, Tesla and NEO, which NEO doesn't have as much history as Tesla, but still both companies have lost about $4 billion cumulative, where General Motors has booked $80 billion. Uh, Stellantis, again, former Fiat Chrysler, which didn't IPO till later 2014, 2015 period, you know, $20 billion and Ford over $50 billion. Yet these companies are worth you know, a quarter of what Tesla is worth. And we've seen all the announcements about, um, you know, a fully electric future from General Motors by 2035 or whatever it is, and, and, and more and more announcements of electric vehicles. Um, but really, this is the slide that, that will drive that, right? So they'll talk about it a lot, but the fact of the matter is there's gonna be three things that really push electrification. One of them, is is simply profitability and if you look uh, it ha and i mean profitability of the electric vehicle specifically and if you look at this at this chart and you talk about the adjusted pre-tax income of those three companies the the what we would consider the domestic manufacturers combined over that time frame you know they've earned 160 billion dollars in adjusted profit yet just that top half of the of the market cap block is is over that same earnings period. So they've earned a lot, but haven't got a lot of compensation in terms of market cap or valuation from the market for earning that kind of money. Where when you look at Tesla and Neo combined, they've lost $9 billion and added $733 billion worth of market cap. So things are a little bit backwards. So one of two things has to happen, right? One is the electric vehicle companies have to come back down to earth in terms of valuation 
or the legacy automakers have to be recognized for their capabilities. And when I say capabilities, what I mean is these are companies that are global, that are profitable, that sell millions of vehicles around the world every year that already have the design and engineering and manufacturing and distribution and after sales scale in place globally but aren't getting valued for it. So really it comes down to, we have the infrastructure in, in, in place, and now all we have to do is put electric drivetrains in vehicles and we can ramp up volume very quickly, much quicker than what Neo or Tesla or Rivian or, other the, or any of the other nascent EV companies can do. So, uh, so again, you have automakers that can look across at, Tesla's income statement and see that it hasn't been profitable. And, and I know, you know, people talk about, uh, well, they've been prof profitable for five quarters consecutively. And while that is true, their regulatory credit sales have ex exceeded their net income. So what that means is that uh, for producing zero emission vehicles, they get credits for uh, not producing enough zero emission vehicles. Uh, competitors have to buy credits from Tesla. And, and while on the revenue scale for Tesla, it's not a lot, there's basically no cost associated with this revenue. So essentially, it just goes right to the profit line. So if you look um, in 2020 alone, Tesla recorded $1.2 billion in profitability, but they sold $1.5 billion worth of regulatory credit. So by that measure, you know, still not... Uh, creating any sense of urgency for competitors to do what Tesla does. Meanwhile, again, we're at 80% truck and those are very profitable companies. So the rush to really get electric vehicles, unprofitable electric vehicles to market really isn't there yet. Um, and so here's how it looks in context of the total industry. In 2020, again, which was a down year, normally this would be about in the mid $600 billion range. Um, EVs were, um, you know, 20 billion of it. Um, so three and three point four percent in terms of retail revenue, um, and that's and that's because the the average transaction price, which is really driven by Tesla, is much higher than the average for the for the internal combustion vehicle. So where volume in the U.S. is two percent. Uh, revenue is 3% because of that higher transaction price of electric vehicles. So there's going to be three things, what we've been saying, three things that drive legacy automakers to electric vehicles. Obviously, profitability is the big one. If the technology was profitable, everybody would be doing it. And, there, and I have no doubt about that. Um, it's why they do trucks to 90% of the mix, because it's profitable. Uh, so you know, if Tesla and Neo were earning something in that ballpark there, there might be a little greater sense of urgency to do electric vehicles as automakers chase simply the bottom line. The other thing is um, when and if the threat to the most important segments for the, for the uh, legacy automakers is real. And the first place that will happen would be in full-size pickup trucks, right? So that segment, and we look at that segment by revenue, is a $140 billion segment. It's, again, because of 2020, it should be even a little bit more. Um, and then you can see what that revenue contribution is for each of those automakers there. And just to put that in context, the next largest segment by retail revenue is compact crossovers. And that's everybody, right? So that slice there is all the import manufacturers, uh, Asia-based and European-based manufacturers that are selling in those segments. So General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis are taking a big chunk of what is the entire next segment just in pickup trucks, right? So that's what they're going to continue to sell because, because that's where the profitability is. Now, when Tesla comes with Cybertruck, you know, which we're figuring might be about 2023 before that reaches scale. Same thing with Rivian with its R1T pickup truck. When those sort of nascent EV manufacturers are coming for pickup share, you're going to see uh, GM, Ford, the Ram brand with 
you know, with a defensive position in terms of products to put in those segments as well. Just because they're not selling things unprofitably now doesn't mean they don't have the technology that they haven't been developing the vehicles. They're just not as out front wanting to sell vehicles that they know that would lose them money at this point. And then the third thing, and again, so that 25% at the top there is that pickup trucks, large full-size pickup trucks are 25% of all U.S. retail revenue. So by far the biggest segment uh, that we have in the U.S. there. And the third one would be the government. And again, you know, even, and we say profitability is the big, is the big issue with electrification and those other two points, right? A threat to the pickup truck segment is really about profitability. And it's the same thing here. Uh, and this third point that would drive EV adoption would be um, government intervention or, or some regulatory climate that penalizes automakers for not doing more electric vehicles, which is what is happening right now in Europe. So Europe is probably the most intense shift to electrification right now because those uh, emission reduction goals after the VW uh, diesel scandal are pretty intense. So you can see what happened in 2020 as the year came to a close and automakers saw what they had to do in terms of uh, emissions reductions, uh, the sale of electric, electric vehicles intensified up to the point where now these are going to be plug-ins as well. So it was up over 20% and it dropped to um, just about 12 but I didn't put a separate slide in, but in just battery electric vehicles, that was about 12% by the end of the year, and it's back below 6% uh, in January and February as well. So uh, the government is the wild card here where they can motivate manufacturers to, to do cer certain behaviors that they want by hitting them in the pocketbook, um, but we don't have that kind of intensity here in the US quite yet. So. Europe is the most uh, sort of punitive in terms of not hitting emissions goals. China, we see typically uh, subsidize EV sales a lot, whether it's uh, high rates of taxation on, on internal combustion vehicles and no taxes on uh, electric vehicles or giving the consumer money. It's all things that we don't really do here in the US quite yet that would, that would spark sort of demand from the consumer. So, uh, let me touch on another sort of what looks like a bubble, and that would be in retail autos uh, as well, and, and sort of changing the way dealerships work and, and the way um, people buy, uh, consumers buy vehicles. So here's two of the four segments we consider within uh, dealer groups, uh, you know, by at retail. So used vehicle and, and new vehicle. And you can see that sometime in about 2018, used vehicle uh, by, by revenue passed new vehicle. And again, the transaction prices are gonna be a little bit lower on used, maybe about half, um, but you're seeing them take over. And I think a big part there is uh, margin on, and I'll show you that slide in just a second, but margin on new vehicles is much lower. So you get more dealerships looking to uh, enhance that sort of gross profit margin by selling uh, used vehicles, right? Where there's a little bit more differentiation. But what we've seen is the creation of online only used vehicle sellers. Now CarMax was the big one in terms of used vehicle, but that was a brick and mortar. Uh, you know, obviously they're developing their om omni-channel capabilities, but what we have is Carvana, Vroom is another one, Shift is another one, but Carvana is sort of the big name in the space. And it's a story very similar to that Tesla and Neo market cap versus revenue story where you have, you know, Carvana market cap dwarfing big established names in the space, CarMax, AutoNation, Penske, uh, and even Vroom, which has, you know, a reasonable market cap, but doesn't do a whole lot of revenue. Um, you know, so again, we could probably look at this as a bubble and, and look, and I get it, right? I've been doing the sort of Wall Street, the equity analysis thing for years, and it's it's about buying into the future and the growth potential. Same thing with Tesla. Um, you know, but I guess the question is, will Carvana be be doing as much, you know, total revenue as as um, AutoNation in five years or CarMax in five years and it's and it, or profitability? And it's a little bit of a stretch. So here's adjusted operating income, similar slide to what we had on the manufacturers. 
Carvana still, they've had one, one profitable quarter, uh, EBITDA profitable quarter, um, but nowhere in the range of what, and this is just for, for a single year, this is for 2020, but nowhere near in the range of what CarMax, Lithia, AutoNation, um, Penske Auto Group are already doing. Uh, but a lot of the talk is that people don't want to go to dealerships. People want the online experience, and that's what the valuation is coming from for companies like Carvana. So, and again, this goes back to the idea of um, people are buying the future, right? Carvana's growth in in used vehicle transactions is is much greater than anybody in the space. Granted, you know the the maturity of those other of those other brands is significant. Um, but Carvana has been adding a, a lot of uh, a lot of unit sales, uh, growing revenue very quickly, uh, and they've been doing it unprofitably for now, and they've been rewarded for it with market cap in the, in, in the space right now. So here's here's um, really what it looks like by the industry, and you can see that in the top gross gross profit by vehicle segment, the total there. Um, you know, and these are the two we talked about, right? So while they're back and forth in, in range of total revenue, you can see because of that 5% gross margin on new vehicles, which has actually been much better, it's 6.3. You can see uh, down a little bit lower in the gross margin, that was 5%, um, where used vehicle sales are 9%, uh, pushing up on 10%. So you're getting dealerships wanting to shift focus to the pre-owned market. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, these are the two where it's really uh, where the money is made. So parts and service by revenue is the third largest segment for a dealer, but by gross profit, it's by far the, the, the largest because you're talking about 50% gross margin in the service base. So the point to all this is, uh, yeah, and there you can see the margin uh, new vehicle, which goes back to 5% a couple of years ago compared to what it was for use. And that was the, the, the impetus for the shift. But I think what you can see going forward um, is that is that dealerships aren't going anywhere. We've seen reports, you know, Volvo is going online only. It doesn't mean the dealership goes away. It just means the dealership has to change in the sense uh, that perhaps it's it's fewer uh, commission salespeople, right? And the, and the transaction happens online, but you're still going to need dealerships for distribution, for repair, for parts. Uh, for you know any of that after sales kind of stuff, uh, but as of right now, those vehicles are getting are getting uh, or those companies are getting valued because they do the online only, no touch. I don't have to deal with the salesperson thing, and and this is a little bit busy. But what we what we did was we basically said that that more sales will go online, but it doesn't necessarily mean they come from the franchise dealers. We think that those sales actually come from the peer to peer. So if there's 40 million used vehicle transactions in the U S every year, a larger, a larger chunk of those are going to go to the online only to the Carvanas of the world, but they'll also go to the existing dealer groups, you know, something like an auto nation or a Penske auto group, or even a CarMax as they improve their online only capabilities. So they don't go away. I think they take sales from the peer to peer because you have warranties, you have vehicles that have been vetted, that have been repaired. You also have return policies. CarMax is doing 30 days, Carvana is doing seven days. All these things that are protecting the consumer, which you don't get in a peer to peer transaction. Prices may be better, but the longer term cost may be worse. So, um, so there's really, you know, nothing to fear as a dealership. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think the process has to change a little bit. Um, and then those, that big volume that's out there will actually come from the private sales, the peer to peer sales. Um, and that'll be driven by leasing. We had a little bit of a dip in 2020, but you can see in that far right column there that we're averaging 5 million units coming back uh, to the market through 2022. So the used vehicle uh, market will be well supplied for another couple of years or at least through next year. Um, and that will help drive the used vehicle market. And there you go, you know, um, with that little dip in 2020 because of the, because of the pandemic, we're down to 4.2 in 2023, but still a very healthy market overall. Um, 
and there there's just one uh, that looks like uh, what certified pre-owned is doing by manufacturer, the largest brands in Toyota leads in that space, which is an advantage for dealers, franchise dealers over the Carvanas of the world, where franchise dealers can actually sell certified pre-owned vehicles of their brand, where CarMax and Carvana don't. They offer warranties and return policies, but they're not actually certified by the manufacturer. Um, and there's the CPO by store, Mercedes-Benz, and again, Toyota's up there because they don't have a whole lot of stores relative to what the domestic manufacturers have. And that's my time. I will send it back to Rebecca and welcome any questions anybody might have. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Certainly always insightful information um, and a lot of it. So let's talk about effective approach and really how we approach every dealership's campaign. Uh, first, we're going to find the audience. So we use really four pillars. So we're finding the audience, targeting, reporting, and proving out on it. So finding the audience means we use the data to find, obviously, the potential customers um, that are willing to or most likely to visit your dealership. We're going to target them regardless of what screen or device that they're using. Reporting out really to show how we can optimize the campaigns and make them more efficient and continue to target with precision. And then proof, really proving the online and offline attribution of what's happening uh, to website traffic and what's happening with the results of the campaign and are there things that we need to do in order to optimize it even more. So with Effective, we obviously look at many different campaigns and we always are analyzing data to really see which, where there's opportunities. And when you look at this, this really shows that we analyzed over 100,000 um, different campaigns, 37,000 of them that were auto specific and in the market for vehicles. Really, it was almost 11 million commercials that aired and it would take any one of us, you or I, 10 plus years to watch that many commercials. The data that we derived from this and the best practices that we discovered is obviously more networks delivers more reach and higher frequency. Broad day parts, 65% of the viewing and impressions were outside of the prime time window. And then sports, sports always will deliver more. So what we, what we realized is that campaigns with sports that incorporated sports delivered about a 30% higher reach than campaigns that did not incorporate sports. And really kind of the sweet spot is 15% of the overall impressions in sports delivered the highest amount of reach. So let's talk about the finding and targeting. Really, this is where the rubber meets the road for us. And this is using our set-top box data that we really analyze. And what you're looking at here is from the DCDMA and it's just one zone and it really, we can pull it for any zone inside of your PMA. But what it will do is tell us the exact amount of hours that are spent, whether or not the, the consumers are using video on demand, the best networks, um, whether they're watching sports and news, the percentage of time they're watching cable versus broadcast. And it's really a combination of using third party, first party deterministic and probabilistic data. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how leveraging your dealership's data in combination with this really drives the most effective campaign. So again, what you're looking at here is, is the zone in DC. It really says that almost eight hours were spent and daily time spent watching and consuming TV. 89% of it was watched live. 70% of it was watched on cable. And the average was about 13 networks. You can also see that 73% of those viewers also used and watched video on demand. And 30 per, 30, 30, about 34% watched sports and news. So again, this just helps to guide us to find the audience and then really target exactly where they are, where we should put your message. Now, we talked a little bit about leveraging in the dealership's data. So what we call that is bring your own data. And the process is just this, it's pretty simple. Uh, we have a client database portal that we put your CRM data in and it's encrypted and it's secure. We then take your data and match it against the Comcast households to really try to get a one-to-one -one match where we can. Where we can't, we'll create custom lookalike data. So we'll create a lookalike audience based on the match data and really give us the potential to reach new clients outside of your existing database. Then following that, we'll build the custom targeted campaign uh, to reach this audience. And it will include data-driven linear TV, household addressable streaming and video, as well as top box video. So let's dig in even a little deeper because what this does is this really allows us to provide unique and actionable insights and create a strategy that maximizes every dollar you spend on your campaign. So this, and you're gonna hear a little bit about this from John Berna uh, later on, because this is exactly the dealership that he is gonna refer to in his case study. This is the data that we used in order to design and build that campaign. So when you look at the Nashville DMA, again, it's a client in Nashville, uh, this dealer's bring your own data 
in, for us indicated that the audience, their specific CRM data audience spent six hours and 49 minutes of TV with TV daily. 69% of that was spent on cable and about 31% on broadcast. It also showed us that their average client is watching about 10 insertable cable networks. 65% of it is viewed outside of the prime time window. 27% of their audience is watching news and sports and 70% of their audience is watching video on demand. So again, that helps us to really build a data informed campaign. And then next we looked at what are the networks that had the highest reach and the highest index in order to reach that audience. So again, this coupled with our set top box data really allows us to get a complete audience that we're targeting based on new potential customers for them as well as their existing database. And then we talked about the reporting improving because this is kind of the final stage. There's a lot of different ways that we can report and prove out on campaigns and data that we can look at in different data sets to really look at the effectiveness of what's happening with these campaigns. So one of those is campaign audience analytics. It really will show us how well the target audience was reached. So if you were looking for in market for new or used or luxury, how well did we reach that audience? Which network proves to be the most efficient? How many impressions were actually delivered? We also have the effective streaming report that's gonna tell us what content and what platforms the, the ad was delivered. Also, how much of the video was completed and completed in full, what kind of creative worked the best. So it really allows us to look at the effective streaming and analyze that. Impact Campaign Insights is really gonna say, did brand awareness and website traffic go up and increase as your campaign launched? What were, what were the things that happened based on zones that you bought? How much can we account for website traffic? How much traffic is attributed to direct and organic? Um, so just a lot of different information from the Impact uh, Campaign Insights report. And then lastly, Instant Impact um, is another big one for us. It's your custom dashboard that will really show us the website traffic within 30 minutes of the commercial airing. Um, and you know, typically we're gonna look at your dealer KPIs and what's most important to you and then continue to optimize it. So what days worked better, what time and what, you know, when were the audiences most engaged, what zones were outperforming and match that up against Polk, as well as what creative was best received. So again, just a lot of data on the front end to build these campaigns, to inform us how to build them and strategize with them. And then also on the back end to really see what's working and are we targeting them efficiently and effectively. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Kevin Bacon, who's really gonna talk about Effective's unique cross-reach solution that will include set-top box data on OTT and obviously VOD um, and just all the different things around our full funnel solution that make Effective very unique and efficient. So we know the importance of the auto data and informing any of your decisions as we build campaigns. So Kevin Bacon is gonna to talk to us about some of the unique abilities with effective cross-reach solution to include OTT, VOD, and certainly traditional TV. Kevin Bacon, over to you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I am so um, privileged and excited to be here today to be on this panel. I learned so much uh, from Kevin Tynan every time he speaks. And, and uh, it was so interesting how he pointed out that there is, seems to be a difference in what's valued, <laughs> right? In the trades and in, in the public versus what really makes the money and actually drives EBITDA. And I think we see the same thing when we look across uh, the video landscape and specific to specifically OTT and streaming television. There is, I think, a perception of what is happening and what that could drive for us. But then there is the reality that really drives impact. And so following suit, what we wanna do is I think for every operator and any marketer out there, allow data to inform your decisions, to help you build your business, efficiently and effectively. And so I wanna share with you some of that data that can help you do that. And I think that as we continue to progress and things change, lock in on these key performing indicators and they will continue to uh, inform you as to what you should do. We know that OTT and streaming television is growing rapidly. It now accounts for 17% of all time spent with video. Um, however, we see nearly three fourths of the households are still subscribing to some type of a subscription based video on demand. 
So we're finding that people are watching a combination of different types of viewing and not just OTT or not just streaming TV or not just live television. There seemed to be this convergence of a blend, if you will. And so that becomes important for you to make sure that we're watching those trends so that your marketing strategies and uh, your executions follow what is actually happening happening in the viewing space. For example, for, for all that we hear about streaming television and OTT, still 73%, nearly 75% of all viewing is, is happening live or time shifted <laughs> in the traditional way. However, we do see there's a very heavy OTT viewing audience. That's the 18 to 34. Nearly 60% of the time spent viewing for that audience is within streaming television. So depending on your strategy, if your really key audience that you're looking to drive and really trying to get to, uh, to buy vehicles from you is that 18 to 34, then obviously it makes sense for you to index more of your strategy into the streaming TV or the OTT space. But overall, if you are looking to reach the masses and, and do it in a way in which they're viewing, we still see three fourths of that overall time spent viewing is happening in the traditional way. And when we start to peel back the layers of that to what really matters, not just reaching people, but reaching those who are in market to buy a vehicle. You know, I've really never sat across from a dealer operator and uh, asked them, uh, hey, who would you like to reach with your commercial or with your advertisement? And the answer is always the same. Those people who are in the market to buy my vehicles right now. And so really, that's really what we're talking about doing. How do we effectively reach that audience? Well, uh, luckily for us within Comcast, we have the ability to look across all platforms and then measure the uniqueness that happens when we deduplicate uh, what's happening within our cross-platform campaigns. And for example here, we're seeing that only 13% of the in-market target reach was achieved with OTT or streaming only. And so while we see that there's a, a growth, certainly a growth area, we're finding that it's really not enough on its own to drive good in-market target reach. And so what, we, uh, what we've also identified is that there's a reason why that is the case. Um, if you were to, if you were a marketer right now, I, I would ask you this question. If you were to say yes to every OTT and, and streaming offering that uh, you get offered on a daily and weekly basis, if you said yes to every single one of those, do you think they would actually fulfill? <laughs> that the campaign would actually fulfill? I would uh, present to you that they wouldn't. And the reason why they wouldn't is because nearly half of the OTT content is not ad supported. I mean, nearly half. So for all of the viewing that's happening out there, we're still not at a place where the impressions available for us to deliver targeted in market impressions is just not the same. So there's this value of what we think is happening out there and then what the reality is that can actually drive people into our dealerships to get us uh, to, to sell more vehicles. In fact, nearly eight times as many ad supported, uh, ad -supported opportunities exist when you do the cross platform strategy. So that's a recommendation that I would have for any operators or any marketers out there Make sure that you're looking at the full scope of what's available so that you can drive in market target reach. And here's the other thing that I wanted to share with you for all there, for all of the chatter and talk about uh, streaming and OTT and cord cutting, really at the end of the day, seven, nearly 75% of all of the ad viewing in the streaming OTT world is happening on the big screen between two devices, connected TV, so that's where your smart TVs lie, 
and then set top box VOD. Nearly a quarter, nearly a quarter of all of the uh, streaming or video on demand viewing is happening on that device. So right now, if you don't have uh, set top box VOD as part of your streaming or OTT solution, you're potentially missing a quarter or more of that target in market audience. So again, we wanna allow the data to tell us how we should be marketing and how we should be executing our campaigns, not necessarily listening to the value uh, of what's being said to us out there. We wanna look at the actual data and allow that to inform us to drive our business. Okay, and so how then would I recommend you look at the entire landscape? I recommend that you look at the entire landscape. And, and, and if your objective is to reach every household or every person that's in your PMA, that's in the market for a vehicle and communicate your unique value proposition to them via video, activate the entire video landscape. Of, not, of, of, of course, digital and streaming TV across all devices, but you wanna make sure that you activate set-top box VOD and data-driven linear television. We are so close to a point where we are uh, getting to true one-to-one -one addressability, but right now you can still, we're seeing uh, dealers, smart dealers and smart marketers driving upwards of 71, 70% of in-market target reach in their backyard. You see that uh, just outside of that sweet spot of in-market to buy today are those who are in-market to buy in the next 120 days. So even though uh, those campaigns are, are, are not hitting 100% in-market target, those people who are still getting your commercial who are not in market right now, they will be within the next couple of months. So it really makes a great, efficient and effective campaign. If there's anything that I can reiterate and underline for you today, it is allow the data to inform your decisions and allow the data to help you continue to build your automotive business efficiently and effectively. And so I hope that I've been able to help you with some of that data today. And I'll turn it back over to you, Rebecca. And uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Kevin. A lot of great information. And let's see it come all together full circle. So with us again, we have Darcy Heaser, who is a regional auto specialist with Effective, and John Berna with Driven Data to really talk about a, a, an amazing case study that we saw fantastic results from with a data informed campaign. Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us. I have my fire going for our fireside chat today. You and I have been working together for a while now, and today we're talking about a major success story between Driven Data and Effective. Can you please describe for us what Driven Data is all about and what you've been doing with us lately? Yeah, so Driven Data is a very unique um, agency. We're actually a software company first and an agency second, and we only serve dealers. Uh, and the company I founded, the company right here out of my house, and I know we're all back in our houses from the pandemic, uh, but back in 2015, the whole mission was to integrate dealership data into one platform, provide an analytics offering that told the story of what that data was actually saying, and then leveraging that inside of modern marketing, both in digital and now with Comcast television offering. Um, and uh, we're excited to be here and share the results of um, one dealership uh, who had, a, and again, a, a phenomenal um, result right after starting with Effective. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, let's dive into the results. Let's get started. Absolutely. So to set the table, and I think, you know, today we've seen a lot of data, and I know it can be overwhelming at times. Um, I'm going to show six individual slides are going to tell the story of what happened. So if you're at a dealership and you've heard through this presentation today and you're, you, the question to you should be, what does this really mean for me and how does this work? What we're going to provide, what I'm going to show today is a practical 90 day case study of what actually happened. Now to start, this is a Toyota dealership in a top 25 market 
And they had been on TV over the past uh, few years, but not really too much in 2019. And our uh, marketing started with them in November of 2020. So right at the end of 2020. Now we have been providing marketing um, and agency support from them um, for the majority of, for all of 2020. Uh, so prior to 2019, we, we were not uh, their agency of record. So in 2020, we had been doing uh, $35,000 per month in digital marketing. That marketing primarily was on Facebook and Google's platforms. And really the challenge was how are we going to expand awareness and drive more volume um, throughout all of 2020, really after the pandemic, gross profit per vehicle has not been a problem, but they finally were in a position where they had inventory and it was time to go sell it. So with Effective, we came up with a strategy, Darcy um, and I and the rest of the Comcast team worked for weeks behind the scenes and we leveraged the first party data from uh, the dealership, um, integrated that into our platform and then also into Comcast platform and really build a custom strategy from the ground up that uh, was right for them. And so this included our continuation of the $35,000 in digital marketing plus an additional 35,000 within the effective platform, um, leveraging again, BYOD. And so that started in November. Wow. So one of your auto clients utilized effective bring your own data, meaning they brought their own CRM data to the table with our digital product. What were the results of that? Let's talk about website traffic. Yeah. So to start with website traffic, and again, we, we looked at this um, from, you know, from Google Analytics, which any of you obviously can do. And right away in November, we saw the traffic start to dramatically accelerate after we launched campaigns. So campaigns started um, not at the beginning of November, I think it was the actual second week of November, but we saw an immediate bump in traffic. So the blue is the current um, period, kind of again, last November, December, January, and orange would be the prior year. So you can see the difference in the chart right here from 21,000 uh, users in November of uh, 2019 up to 27,000. So a very dramatic increase right away. And we saw that continue to go through the rest of, again, the fourth quarter into the beginning of the first quarter. So that traffic was up 33%. So in that 90 day case study, 86,000, just under 87,000 users, that's 21,000 up from the prior year. Um, and where did this traffic come from? Well, it came from exactly where we expected. It came from direct and it came from organic. So those two mediums had the largest share of increase, which was exactly what we hoped for. And uh, that was borne out in the numbers. Wow. So you're saying there was traffic increase to the website, but what about goal completion? Did you have many of those? Yeah. So what was great about this organization is they did a fantastic job um, prior and with us to make sure that their goal conversions were accurately set up on the website. So this is something before you're launching campaigns like this, you really want to have that set up. It's not very difficult, but what you really want to ensure is that you're capturing the signal of form submissions of leads of, of calls into the dealership of chats, because those are the things that are the most measurable. So really looking at the goal conversions over time. And again, just to be clear, the orange line is when we started doing television, blue line is prior. This dotted line represents exactly when the campaign started. So I have a little bit of data from prior, just so you can see where it was. And now orange is extending on it. This is a weekly basis of data all the way through, even including February, because we've been continuing the advertising through February. What you'll see again is this clear fork in the road um, between the prior year, which is blue, and the current year, which is orange. And so what does that mean? Well, goal completions were up almost 100%. Um, and that wasn't just from traffic, right? So if you have more traffic, you should, if quality of traffic is the same, you'd expect your goal conversions to go up at the same rate. That was not the case. The goal conversion rate was up 53% as well. So the number of conversions were up and the rate was up. And again, when we dive into the numbers and we look, where does that come from? 96% increase in direct, 99% increase in organic. And so again, exact, exactly what we expected, the traffic carried into goal conversions and those goal conversions obviously dramatically improved as well. Wow, an increase of almost 100% in goal completion. That's crazy. Uh, what about hard conversions like calls? Yeah, so 
when you break this out by week, it's a little bit hard to kind of see it, but I wanted to make sure that it was, it was clear how, how consistent this process was. This wasn't like a herky jerky, you know, we ran media and then all of a sudden there's goals and then it falls off. It was sustained throughout the entire period. So when you look at it on a weekly basis, you can see that sustained. Here, when you look at it on a monthly basis, you can actually see the aggregation. So blue is the current year, um, orange is the prior year. And this is where it really starts to spread out between the prior. Now, what is a goal conversion to us? Well, it's very simple. They submit a lead, they click to call, they submit, they uh, chatted online, or they went through a digital retailing experience, which is a separate type of tracked goal conversion. So sometimes agencies may set up on goal conversions, things like um, VDP views, vehicle detail page views, or they may look at like time on site. Those were not goals that were used. These were goals where the customer uh, sub, uh, went through a process to identify themselves to the dealership. Um, that is what we consider to be a conversion. And so again, starting in October where we were consistent, we we're up versus prior year, but not nearly to the extent of what happened in November, December, and January. And you'll see January is not a great month in the car business, 1625 in goal conversions versus the prior year of 588. Wow. Well, I see where you're going here. You're getting closer and closer to the sale. Let's talk about leads. How many leads did this client receive? Yeah. So again, um, looking at the lead volume, uh, same story, current years in blue, prior years in orange. Um, and what was interesting, and again, December is Toyota-thon. Um, it's uh, one of the, the most important months of every Toyota dealer's year. And this uh, you know, from a messaging, from a communication standpoint, the ads were crafted with that in mind and we peaked in lead count in December. Um, and on a, on a year over year basis, this was an increase of during the period, again, a thousand, a thousand, almost 1200 leads or a 20% increase in leads. And so where did that come from? Well, internet leads were up 12%. That was the lion's share at 4,200 but phone, phone was up 95%. And this to me was what was really exciting was how much the increase in inbound call volume. Um, and these were not just incoming calls. These were incoming calls that were recorded as an incoming lead um, on a newer used vehicle. So obviously inside of dealerships, the number of calls you get, not every single call is a lead. These were specifically vehicle of, uh, you know, specifically people that are looking for a vehicle. So that increase of 95% was quite stark. Obviously showroom traffic was down, why? Because it's a pandemic. And so your showroom traffic's down 15%. Um, I think most dealers would take that as long as you're pretty close to the prior year. But where we saw that massive surge was again in phone traffic. Nice. Honestly, John, my biggest takeaway from all this is movement of metal. Let's talk about car sales. Let's, let's look at those. Yeah, and this is really the, the most exciting part. So this is broken down uh, a little bit differently. So new vehicles are split from used. So you can see new here, used here, and this is for the month of November. So again, in the month of November, you can see a modest increase in new car volume. Again, from 232 up to 266, used cars were roughly the same. It was then in December that we saw a dramatic increase in new car volume. Again, from 192 up to 281 with used cars also now starting to follow suit up to 163 from 118. Um, and again, December should be uh, one of the most exciting months of the year for volume. That is when volume is really important as you finish the year. What we weren't expecting was that same amount of volume to continue in January, which is what would actually happen. So in the month of January, they, um, had 457 sales that was up from 339 the prior year. You have to go back to August of 2019 to find a month better than that January of 457. And that's just not normal. January should not be that good. It was, and again, I think it, it bears repeating, these numbers got better over time. Um, so as we continued the momentum and continued the messaging um, again, sales started to increase. So again, 28% increase in sales. Uh, if you look at dealerships last year, generally gross profits been up and volume has been down. Um, gross profits have been up a lot. Volume has, has usually been down. This is not normal, again, to be almost 300 cars up year over year. 
um, between November and January. I love that you said this success is not normal. I love how awesome this success story truly is. You were talking about profits, and I've heard that a lot recently with our dealers and how profitable they've been. Uh, let's get into that, the gross profit. What did you see there? Yeah, so looking at the long story of gross profit, I think it's important to note that this dealership has been um, a volume dealer focused on you know, selling um, primarily new vehicles more so than used. What's really transition, what really happened, of course, through all dealers is starting in around May and June, gross profit averages have accelerated. Um, going into Toyotathon, this dealer said, you know, we want to dramatically increase new car volume. How do we do that? And we wanted to obviously support that with, you know, advertising that, that supported that. So they slightly changed their gross profit tendencies from, you know, again, being just over 2000 to being just under 2000 as an average. Um, and again, when you compare this to prior periods, uh, this dealership has had a, a quite remarkable um, rate of increase. And so all being said, between November and uh, January, when you compare that year over year, it's an overall million dollar increase in gross profit for an additional 100,000, 105,000 in media spend. So total variable gross increase during these three months versus prior three prior months uh, was over 1 million at the expense of 105,000. I think we'd all take that. I'm at a loss for words. This is amazing. Um, I know there's a lot of factors in here, but what do you attribute the success to? Well, I would also, I would say that the dealership, I mean, they had the vision to, um, push through when I think a lot of dealerships um, have, have still are still conservative. They decided, you know what, we want to increase our used car volume. We want to increase our new car volume. And we're willing to, um, to put ourselves out there and spend some additional money investing in that strategy. So it was a total mindset. It wasn't just like, you know, marketing doesn't sell cars, salespeople sell cars. Um, what marketing did is it created the traffic that created the conversions that led to the leads, and then they executed extremely well. And I think uh, ultimately it was both the marketing and the sales operations working together, sharing this data together, talking about this that led to that outcome. I like that. I heard it's a mindset. That was my biggest takeaway from what you just said and all the different conversions as well. Um, last thing, and then we're out. Um, what should dealers consider if they're trying to do the same thing, if they're trying to have the same success or do BYOD, what's your top takeaway for dealers today? Yeah. So I think, you know, obviously by first integrating and then um, evaluating the first party data that you have, you can organize it and come up with some, some, some strategies for success. The first thing I would consider is, you know, your prior sales and prior service customers are extremely valuable. Um, when you couple that with your CRM data, as, as we did, um, you can really start to see, okay, these are the people that have purchased from me. These are the people that have purchased in service. These are the people that have inquired. And what you're really looking for is, you know, a, a good mix of prior customer data that you can now take to Comcast, work with them and come up with strategies to identify uh, similar customers, uh, customers that are in market um, within certain zones that obviously they're gonna be close proximity to the store to, you know, drive traffic. But, you know, start with the data, talk to Comcast or talk to Driven Data, and we can obviously support you. Start with the data. I like it. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it back to Rebecca. Thank you. John, I appreciate your willingness to obviously partner with us and trust the data and being willing to share such a tremendous uh, case study. That's fantastic. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, special guests, obviously, for speaking and presenting. So Kevin Tynan, Kevin Bacon, Darcy Heiser, and John Berna. Glad that we got together today. Hopefully you guys felt it informative and insightful. Uh, we'll make sure that we do a follow-up with a recorded version of this to all attendees. And as always, thanks, have a great day and we look forward to hearing from you.